we are continuing our study of the ancient but current letter Paul the Apostle wrote to followers of Jesus in the city of Philippi. Where we are in the study, it is extra important to remember this was a letter. A letter that was read out loud in public. The first designated church building was still about 300 years away, which meant church was typically held in homes. So, though there were times the people from all those house churches would get together, and that was likely what happened as word got around that a letter had arrived from their dear friend and pastor, Paul. It had been about ten years since he had been there to plant the first seeds of faith in Jesus. As we've seen several times through this study, Paul was concerned that foundation of faith was starting to wobble, and that was affecting the unity that their community had been built on. And that's why Paul wrote what we looked at last week. He urged the Christians to do everything without grumbling, complaining, or arguing. Today, we're going to see how Paul got uncomfortably specific and personal with that plea for unity. He had a living, breathing example of people everyone knew who were violating that verse. And Paul wrote, I urge Eodia and Suntuke to iron out their differences and make up. God doesn't want his children holding grudges. Considering how hard and how expensive it was to write and deliver a letter back then, whatever was going on among the Philippian believers had to have been pretty serious for Paul to have taken the time and the space to specifically mention it, and two specific ladies. Now, the fact that Paul didn't give details makes it pretty clear many, if not most, people knew about it, but apparently they had either not known what to do about it, or had been kind of trying to ignore it. Does it surprise you to see a letter in the Bible specifically addressing a disagreement between two people? Does it surprise you to see the disagreement was between women who belonged to the Lord and who worked hard in telling others the good news? Does the Bible mentioning them by name surprise you, especially in a letter that was to be read out loud in a place where those two women almost certainly would have been? If Paul could have written a letter to this church, to South Bay, at any point over the past decade or so, do you think he could have mentioned unresolved, unhealthy disagreements? Do you think he could have named names? Last week, I passed two years here. If you've been around longer than that, would you be surprised if I've heard about several unresolved disagreements and ongoing conflicts, some going back years? Would you be surprised if I said I have heard specific names? How would you feel if I said, I'm going to repeat the line about Eodia and Suntuke and put in local names? Kind of like, I urge blank and blank to iron out their differences and make up. God doesn't want his children holding grudges. Are there names you would expect to see there? Are there names you would hope to see? See, sometimes being a pastor can be like trying to teach porcupines how to hug. And that's why disagreements and conflicts in local churches don't surprise me. And I don't get a sense it was much of a surprise to Paul either. But he wasn't the kind of person who would leave it unresolved, or at least really try to resolve it. Right after he mentioned the simmering disagreement between Eodia and Suntuke, he wrote, I ask you, my true partner, help these two. 
Now that illustrates how different Philippians is from most of Paul's other letters. Philippians is about relationships and the joy they can bring and the joy they can crush. While a lot of what Paul wrote seems pointed at the head, Philippians is like directed at the heart. As I mentioned earlier, when Paul wrote this letter, it had been about 10 years since he had been in Philippi. And despite the time and the distance, look at what he wrote in the opening of the letter. He said, every time I think of you, I give my thanks to God. It is right that I should feel, as I do, about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. Well, now jump over 65 verses to where we are today, where Paul said, I appeal to Eodia and Suntuke, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreements. And through the week, I looked at those two verses together, and I thought about how relationally risky it was for Paul to be so direct with people who meant so much to him. But I began to realize he did it because they meant so much to him. The two at the center of the disagreement, as well as anyone near them. Just think about all the kinds of reactions there could have been in the moments and the days after the letter was read. Very possibly, if not probably, it actually fanned the flames of the problem. But as it almost always does, whatever was going on had hit a point where it had begun to cause what the writer of Hebrews called weeds of bitter discontent. The writer added a thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. If you've been around church for any amount of time, you may have heard the phrase from a more common Bible version, a root of bitterness. Some versions of the Bible say that bitterness corrupts. Others say it stains or defiles people around a bitter person or bitter people. The original wording said many can be infected. That's because bitterness and its close cousins, resentment and cynicism, are contagious. And as they grow, respect and trust shrink. And places that have low levels of trust and respect almost always have unresolved, unhealthy disagreements and conflicts. Now, from there, I'm going to take a side path into the world of science, but it relates directly to this. Inside the human brain, scientists have identified a little almond-shaped set of neurons called the amygdala. It's like the brain's key to processing emotions. A growing number of scientists have been noticing the amygdala works negatively. Its natural tendency is to trigger negative thoughts, which produce negative emotions, which negatively affect relationships. Well, evolutionary scientists say that's because the first humans a.k.a. cavemen, were among the most defenseless prey. And the scientists say the amygdala evolved the way it did to keep cavemen prepared for the worst in order to survive in a constantly dangerous world. Those who study science through creation believe the negative twist in the brain is either what caused the first sin in the Garden of Eden or was caused by that first sin. Genesis records how the first sin led to the first disagreement between the first people and between each of them and God. Well, with just the turn of a page in Genesis, you can see how bitterness between two brothers led to the first murder, and by the time you hit the last third of the Bible, you'll find Jesus teaching that our core problem is not what we do on the outside, but who and how we are on the inside. 
Jesus said what is in our hearts will show up in what we say or how we speak or in modern terms what and how we text or post or email. And Jesus said having junk in our hearts that gets us trashing someone with words can be as serious as killing someone. Now the way our brains are predisposed to be negative explains why it can be strangely enjoyable to listen to people talk about relational conflicts and why it can be so easy to get drawn into talking about conflicts and even to stir up conflict. It's why it can be so easy to get sucked into a gossip session, and why it's often easier to see and to point out something negative someone else has done than it can be to get and stay excited when someone does something positive. Now, hold on to that thought. We'll come back to it. But thankfully, because of his love and mercy, Jesus endured unthinkable horror on the way to and on the cross to clear the way for the Holy Spirit to begin a ministry like he never had before, doing the kind of inner work we all need. However, a study I found last week found six of every ten self-identified born-again Christians do not believe the Holy Spirit is a real, living being, but is merely a symbol of God's power or presence or purity. What makes that particularly sad is the reality that we all need the Holy Spirit's ongoing inner transformation, at least in part because His continual renovation of our minds and our thinking keeps making us better at addressing conflict and or unhealthy disagreements. And I see two distinct approaches to conflict where we are in Philippians. One involves two people, or two sides, agreeing to come together with a third person or a couple of people to work through it. To get things out of the shadows and into the light, or out from under a carpet where everything may have been swept. That's a more collective approach to conflict as it appears in specific situations. And that's what Paul laid out for Eodia and Suntuke and the person he called his true partner. And then as Paul prepared to wrap up this letter, he shifted to a different approach. One that applies more generally, although it should include and apply to specific situations like the one with Eldia and Suntuke. But Paul turned his attention from them back to everyone. And that really comes across in the way the Message Bible has the start of Philippians 4 8. Summing it all up, friends, I would say you will do your best. By, And again, these words were written by the Apostle Paul, and they were being read aloud to a crowd of Christians who had learned to value and follow Paul's teaching. So they would have leaned in to hear what he was about to say. And what he said was, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable, things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And Paul wrote that in the imperative or the command form and in an ongoing way, as though it was like a call to make it a habit. Our thought life was a common theme for Paul. I think of two powerful examples of that. In one, he wrote, let God transform you, which was originally written more like, let God keep transforming you into a new person by changing, which was originally more like continuing to change the way you think. So, let God keep transforming you into a new person by continuing to change 
the way you think. The other example is similar. It's when Paul said we are to let the Spirit renew our thoughts and our attitudes. And those two verses connect powerfully with where we are in Philippians, where Paul said, fix your thoughts on. Other versions of the Bible say, let your mind dwell on these things. So, fix your thoughts on. Let your mind dwell on things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise. Now, when I first started going to a local church as a young adult, I always and only heard that verse used to evaluate what we read, what we watched, or what we listened to. I mean, it's good to run books and movies and music through a filter like chapter 4, verse 8. But it's not what Paul primarily had in mind in this context. Here, his thoughts were on relationships and resolving conflict between people he cared about. And his challenge, his command, was about the ongoing transforming of the natural negative default setting we saw earlier. Now, Paul didn't have a clue about the amygdala, but he seemed to understand our brains are predisposed to the negative. And that's why it's often easier to see and to point out something negative someone else has done than to get and stay excited when someone does something positive. And I can't help but think Paul was thinking specifically of Eodia and Suntuke as much as anyone when he wrote about fixing your thoughts on things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise. I believe Paul was encouraging Eodia to turn her thoughts to things like that about Suntuke. And I believe Paul was encouraging Suntuke to turn her thoughts to things like that about Eodia. And then Paul turned his attention to anyone who was listening to the letter being read. And as Paul continued to try to breathe peace into the tension, it's as though he wanted to remind everyone that Eodia and Suntuke had worked hard with him in telling others the good news. And he said, they worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are all written in the book of life. That's such a great line. And for just a few moments, if you're a part of South Bay, turn your thoughts to people like them. If you're part of another church, turn your thoughts and memories to people like them there. Again, let your thoughts, let your memories go to people you know have worked hard in getting the good news out. People who have worked hard alongside others. Here at the South Bay, think of a bike trek down the coast and a, a puppet ministry and all kinds of other things we've heard so much about since we got here. And for at least a few moments, look beyond disagreements and hard feelings and into the amazing grace that puts people's names in God's book of life. And let your thoughts be, taking, be taken to those people. And as Paul wrote, let your thoughts dwell on things about them that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise. Let your thoughts dwell on people who have worked hard on getting the good news out. Let your thoughts dwell on people who have worked hard alongside of others. And think beyond disagreements. Think beyond hard feelings. And being together with a wide variety of people who are in God's book 
of life and way beyond all our differences. Think for a few moments about how we have His amazing grace in common. Now, before we close, since Paul got specific and, and very personal with an exercise like that, let's try doing something similar. And for a few moments, Let's each think about someone we have had or maybe are having an unhealthy extended disagreement with, some kind of unresolved conflict. And, and let me point out something that's really important in this. Paul wrote this letter to believers about other believers. So let's each think about a believer we've had or are having a conflict with. And remember, because of the way our brains are naturally wired to work, most of us will think more about the person than the disagreement or the conflict. And that's particularly true as time goes by. And it is often easy to forget what started the whole thing. While our brains tilt more toward negative thoughts about the person. Now, again, just one person, don't overthink it. Just one person that you're having an extended, unresolved disagreement with, conflict. And let's each ask the Holy Spirit to interrupt our thoughts with what we just saw from Paul. And hear him say, here's the thing. Especially if we're going to have a chance of keeping an upper hand on conflict. Let your mind dwell on things about that person that are true, that are honorable, that are right, that are pure, that are lovely, things that are admirable, even things that are excellent, and things that are worthy of Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my moments and my days 